All is one may be true, but one can't treat everything in the world equally. In daily life, one still has to discriminate and make distinctions. I once went for a walk near the housing board buildings, government flats that were built in the 1970s, about 300 meters from me. There was a sewage trench on one side of the building. I could smell the stench of the sewage even though I was a long way away. I stayed away from it because I didn't want to be nauseated by the bad smell. In circumstances such as these, you don't say, All is one, everything is the self, and paddle through the sewage. The knowledge, everything is self, may be there. But that doesn't mean that you have to put yourself in dangerous or health-threatening places. When you have become one with the self, a great power takes you over and runs your life for you. It looks after your body and puts you in the right place at the right time. It makes you say the right things to the people you meet. This power takes you over so completely you no longer have any ability to decide or discriminate. The ego thinks, I must do this or I should not do that, is no longer there. The self simply animates and makes you do all the things that need to be done. If you are not in this state, then use your discrimination wisely. You can choose to sit in a flower garden and enjoy the scent of the blooms. Or you can go down to the trench I told you about and make yourself sick by inhaling the fumes there. So while you still have an ego and the power of discrimination that goes with it, use it to inhale the fragrance that you find in the presence of an enlightened being. If you spend time in the proximity of a nyani, his peace will sink into you to such an extent that you will find yourself in a state of peace. If instead you choose to spend all your time with people whose minds are always full of bad thoughts, their mental energy and vibrations will start to seep into you. I tell you regularly, you are the self. Everything is the self. If this is not your experience, pretending that all is one may get you into trouble. Advaita may be the ultimate experience, but it is not something that a mind that still sees distinctions can practice. Electricity is a useful form of energy, but it is also potentially harmful. Use it wisely. Don't put your finger in the socket, thinking all is one. You need a body that is in good working order in order to realize the self. Realizing the self is the only useful and worthy activity in this life. So keep the body in good repair till that goal is achieved. Afterwards, the self will take care of everything. And you won't have to worry about anything anymore. In fact, you won't be able to because the mind that previously did the worrying, the choosing, and the discriminating will no longer be there. In that state, you won't need it and you won't miss it. What should be the right attitude when one sits in the presence of a nyani? Just keep quiet. Make contact with the silence of the self within. This is the way of making contact with your guru. And it is also the best attitude to have when you are sitting in his presence. I understand. This is also my inner feeling, my own belief of what I need to do. But knowing it does not produce the desired results. I know that if I can make contact with my real guru by abiding as the self within, but it rarely happens. I cannot abide in that state all the time. And when I am out of that state, I am acutely aware of the separation. Then, when I feel that separation, I feel the need to be in the guru's physical presence. The advice, go back to the self within, is not so attractive then, because I know I can't do it. Who is feeling the separation? Who is separate from whom? Ask yourself this question whenever these thoughts arise. I remember a devotee who got very attached to Bhagavan's feet. He would touch his feet and then try to hold on to them for a long time. One day Bhagavan said to him, Don't get attached to the feet because one day they will disappear. 
If you are so attached to physical things when they go, you will be depressed and you will feel miserable. Hold on to the self within. That is the Guru's true feet. It will never go away because it is eternal. The self abides within you as your Guru. It is up to you to find him there and to stay with him. The light of the self cannot be extinguished. It is eternal and imminent. It is not like ordinary lights that can be switched on and off. Once it is discovered within, it will be on all the time. A foreign woman came to see Anamale Swami, and while she was prostrating to him, she seemed to become unconscious of his surroundings and to remain lying on the floor at his feet for about ten minutes. This was not the first time that she had fallen into this state while in Anamale Swami's presence. After watching her for some time, he shouted at her, You should not go into Laya, a trance-like state like this. It is becoming a habit with you. It may give you some kind of temporary happiness, but it is not happiness that helps you spiritually. It is the same as sleep. Even worldly activities are better than this laya. Get out of this habit. Addressing the other people present, people occasionally went into states like this in front of Bhagavan. He never encouraged them, even the ones who appeared to be deep in meditation. I remember one occasion when Bhagavan noticed a man who had been sitting motionless in the hall at least an hour, apparently, in deep meditation. Bhagavan was not fooled. He called the Kunju Swami and others who were present. Shout at him, shake him, and when he wakes up, tell him Giri Pradakshina. This is no better than sleep. This state is not good for him. He is just wasting his time sitting like this. Bhagavan warned us about this state, and he often cited stories of sadhus who had been stuck in this state for years. One of the most frequently told was a story about a sadhu who asked his disciple for a glass of water. While he was waiting for the man to return, he went into a deep lie state that persisted for many, many years. He was in this state so long his disciple died. The river changed its course and different rulers came and went. When he opened his eyes, his first comment was, Where is my glass of water? Before he went into Laya, this thought was uppermost in his mind, and decades later this thought was still there. Bhagavan's comment on this story was, These states are not helpful. They are not samadhi. Whenever I start meditating, soon after I start, I fall into these states. How can I prevent these lay states from coming and taking me over? Keep practicing self-inquiry. This is the way to avoid laya. The mind usually has two habits. Either it is occupied with many thoughts and engaged in activities, or it goes back to sleep. But for some people, there is this third option falling into this lie state. You should not indulge in it because once it becomes a habit, it becomes addictive. It is a pleasant state to be in. But if you fall very deeply into it, it becomes very hard to get out of it. You know what this state is like because you have been in it many times. As soon as you feel the first symptoms of an approaching trance, get up and walk around. Don't remain sitting or lying. Walk around or do some work, and above all, keep up the practice of self-inquiry. If you practice self-inquiry constantly, you will never find yourself falling into laya. You can conquer this habit. You just need to be attentive and do self-inquiry. Bhagavan once remarked, What is the value of knowing God if we don't know the name of our own I? He also spoke about the I-I vibration, saying that it was an emanation of the self. When Bhagavan spoke of I-I, did he mean that it was Shabnadi, a subtle sound, or is it merely the feeling I-I? They both indicate and mean the self. Is the sound also the self? The sound is happening in the self. 
Is it the same as the self, or is it the reflection? It is also a part of the self. So is it like the white color of milk, inseparable from milk? Yes. I am asking this because I hear the sound all the time, but I don't know if I feel the eye-eye in the heart. There is a feeling that I ought to be going deeper, so I ask myself, what is the feeling of the sound? Is this a good practice? Let me give you an example. The fan over our heads is spinning around. A stream of cool air is coming from it, but we also hear the noise of the motor. Both perceptions originate from the working of the fan. It is the same with the self. The soundless sound of the self goes on all the time by itself. It doesn't make a sound. It is the subtle sound. If you tune into this sound, you can't actually listen because it is not a sound. And the answer is I. What happens next depends on where I am. You cannot actually listen because it is not the physical noise. That tuning in will lead you to the peace of the self. That peace is prior to and beyond this very subtle pulsation. When you reach that final peace, that ultimate stillness, the sound will disappear in the self. In that final place, there is no sound, there is only peace, somewhat like the peaceful, soundless state that is experienced in deep sleep. However, full awareness remains there. It is not an unconscious state. Most people cannot hear or be aware of that subtle inner vibration because it is drowned out by the physical noise of the outer world and by the persistent mental noise of the mind. The only people who can hear this sound are those in whom thoughts have mostly disappeared. One needs to be in a deep level of mental peace in order to be aware of this sound. This subtle vibration is resonating all the time in all people, but virtually no one hears it because preoccupation with thoughts covers it up. Bhagavan was not the first teacher to talk about this subtle sound. Himaleka, for example, mentioned it in Tripura Rahasya. So this inner sound is not something newly discovered. Close your mental and physical ears, and you will hear this vibration resonating all the time. As I mentioned before, I hear the sound all the time, but I feel that the experience is not deep enough to take me back to an absorption in the self. I say this because I'm not experiencing the peace that Swami is talking about, the peace in which the sound disappears and leaves peace alone. I'm trying to go deeper. I am asking myself where the feeling of the sound comes from because I want to remain in the heart, in bliss. Enquire, who am I? Or what is my real nature? The nature of the self is nothing but peace. If you are not aware of that peace, it means that you are identifying with something that is not the self. As long as you hear, taste, and smell things, you identify with the body. When the perceptions and the perceiver of them vanish, you become aware of the peace that is there all the time. I hear the sound, then I ask myself, who is hearing the sound? And the answer is I. What happens next depends on where I am. If I am in Swami's presence or in the meditation hall at Sri Ramana Ashram, I feel the presence of the self and the bliss of peace. But when I am away from Swami, it is not so easy. You need not hold on to that because you are that all the time. That is enough. You are that. How can you hold on to that or feel separate from it, or try to get it back, or lose it? If that is your real nature, how can you pretend that you are nearer to it in two places and separate from it when you are somewhere else? I have the experience of that with Swami, but I don't have the same experience when I am away from him. This is definitely my experience, so I don't really understand what you are telling me. Your understanding or your lack of it does not affect the truth of what I am saying. You are that. You see you are, and there will be nothing obstructing the experience of this fact. 
I still say I see who I am when I am near Swami. When I am away from him, I can remember it as a fact, but it is not my direct experience. This is because you identify with your body and your mind. Your mind is making you believe that a certain experience can only happen when you are in a particular place. Give up this identification. And you will find that the self is everywhere. You will see it, know it, and be it wherever you go. Everything is Swami, including yourself. How do I give up identification with the body, particularly when I am not in front of Swami? I keep practicing, but I don't have that experience. Meditate. I am the self. If you do this, the idea that you are the body will go. I am the self. Is still an idea, and as such, it belongs in Maya, along with all other ideas. But you can begin to conquer Maya by giving up utterly wrong ideas that bind you and cause you trouble. How do you do this? Replace them with ideas that are a better reflection of the truth and which are helpful in leading you to that truth. If you want to cut iron, you use another piece of iron. In battle, if someone shoots an arrow at you, you shoot one back. In Maya, if the arrow of a bad idea comes speeding towards you, dodge it. Don't let it stick to you or you will end up in pain. Then in retaliation, fire back the arrow of I am the self at the place where the wrong idea came from. Sadhana is a battlefield. You have to be vigilant. Don't take delivery of wrong beliefs and don't identify with the incoming thoughts that will give you pain and suffering. But if these things start to happen to you, fight back by affirming I am the self, I am the self, I am the self. These affirmations will lessen the power of I and the body arrows, and eventually they will armor plate you so successfully, the I and the body thoughts that come your way will no longer have the power to touch you, affect you, or make you suffer. This fight all takes place within Maya because in reality, you are peace and peace alone. But while you are suffering in Maya, you can use these thoughts as a means of ultimately conquering it. To remain as self, to have this awareness, I am the self. Is it enough that I merely hear this sound, I, I, because I do hear it everywhere? If it is constant, it will be enough. If you don't forget your real self, that will be enough. Your real self is everything. Not an atom exists apart from the self. You, the real you, the self, are all inclusive. When I say give up your identification with the I am the body idea, I do not mean that you are not the body. I mean that you should give up the idea that you are only the body. You are all bodies, all things, all creation, but paradoxically this knowledge will not come to you unless you give up identifying with particular particular objects, such as I am the body, and limiting thoughts such as I am so-and-so. When you have given up all thoughts, all identifications, the true knowledge suddenly dawns on you. I am the unmanifest self, and I am also the whole of manifestation. So I tell people, this physical body is not you, the mind is not you, Go beyond them to see what is really behind them. This is done to make people give up their incorrect, limiting ideas so they can have a direct experience of what is truly real. I am asking people to be aware of the rope of reality instead of being confounded and led astray by the mental illusion of the snake. This I thought seems to vibrate at the same speed as the sound and the feeling of I I. So when I think I, it reminds me of the sound. This seems to happen by itself. But afterwards, I need to think I to remind me of this vibration that is going on. Since you forget your real self, the only way is to go back to your real self. If you keep the light on all the time, darkness cannot enter your room. Even if you open the door and invite it to come in, it cannot enter. 
darkness is just an absence of light. In the same way, mind is just a self-inflicted area of darkness in which the light of the self has been deliberately shut out. You live in the darkness by insisting on believing ideas that have no validity, and you live in the light of the self when you have given up all ideas, both good and bad. So are you saying that believing that I am a body and a particular person is purely imagination? Or better still, a bad habit that I should try to get rid of? Correct. This habit has become very strong because you have reinforced and strengthened it over many lifetimes. This will go if you meditate on your real self. The habit will melt away, like ice becoming water. Bhagavan once remarked that free will is non-existent, that all our activities are predetermined and that our only real choice is either to identify with the body that is performing the actions or with the underlying self in which the body appears. Someone once said to him, If I drop this fan, will that be an act that has always been destined to happen in this moment? And Bhagavan replied, It will be a predestined act. I assume that these predestined acts are all ordained by God and that as a consequence, nothing happens that is not God's will. Because we as individuals have no power to deviate from God's ordained script. A question arises out of this. If I remember the self, is this God's will? And if I forget to remember at a certain moment, is this also God's will? Or taking my own case, if I make an effort to listen to the sound I, I, is this God's will or is it individual effort? Forgetfulness of the self happens because of non-inquiry. So I say, remove the forgetfulness through inquiry. Forgetfulness or non-forgetfulness is not part of your destiny. It is something you can choose from moment to moment. That is what Bhagavan said. He said that you have the freedom either to identify with the body and its activities, and in doing so, forget the self, or you can identify with the self and have the understanding that the body is performing its pre destined activities, animated and sustained by the power of the self. If you have an oil lamp and you forget to put oil in it, the light goes out. It was your forgetfulness and your lack of vigilance that caused the light to go out. Your thoughts were elsewhere. They were not on tending the lamp. In every moment, you only have one real choice to be aware of the self, or to identify with the body and the mind. If you choose the latter course, don't blame God or God's will or predestination. God did not make you forget the self. You, yourself, are making that choice every second of your life. In Swami's book, someone asked him, I am making decisions, but I don't feel that I am making these decisions. It is just my destiny or divine will. You answered him by saying that this was correct, but now you are saying that whether or not one does self-inquiry is nothing to do with destiny at all. The self is always present. Nothing obstructs your awareness of it except your self-inflicted ignorance. Our efforts, our sadhana, are directed towards removing this ignorance. If this ignorance is removed, the real self is revealed. This revelation is not part of destiny. Only the outer bodily activities are destined. So my inner life is my own responsibility. I cannot blame Bhagavan if I am not remembering myself. Bhagavan is always present inside and in front of you. If you don't cover the vision of Bhagavan with your ego, that will be enough. The ego is the I am, the body idea. Remove this idea and you shine as the self. That is the only thing you need to do in this life. The various events of your life, all the things that are going to happen to you, they are all destined. If you don't want them to happen, they will still occur, even if you try to avoid them. And if you want things that are not in your destiny, they won't come to you. 
There is no point worrying about the outer events of your life because you can exercise no control over these destined activities. Your responsibility in this life is to see who you are, not to rewrite your life script. I can therefore blame God, destiny, or Bhagavan for everything that happens to me in this world. But at the same time, I have to assume responsibility for everything that goes on inside me. Correct. This Bhagavan you speak of is not a body, a person who existed at some time. All is Bhagavan. All is Ramana. There can be no mistakes in following Bhagavan's path because Bhagavan is like an eternal light that is always burning, a grace that is always giving. To be aware of Bhagavan is to be aware of this inner truth. If you are not aware of this Bhagavan, it is your responsibility, not his. He is not hiding from you. You are hiding from him. He does not think that he is separate from you. It is you who believe that you are separate from him. The outside world is a miserable, confusing place. There is not much going on there that helps us to remember who we really are. Yes, you can say that this state of affairs is also Bhagavan's grace. Bhagavan's compassion. You could say that he keeps the world like this as an incentive to go inwards. This state of affairs sets up a real choice. If we go outwards, there are problems. If we go inwards, there is peace. I want to ask about some other aspect of this that sometimes troubles me. The desire to become absorbed in self seems to be some kind of vasana. It is still a desire. And to indulge in it implies that I must look thing that I don't already have. With this attitude, I then feel that I am setting up enlightenment as some kind of future goal, and not as something that is here and now. There is something very dualistic in this attitude, and I sometimes get the feeling that I am not accepting Bhagavan's will for the present moment if I am looking for something that is not here and now. This desire is not counterproductive. The desire for enlightenment is necessary, because without it you will never take the necessary steps to realize the self. A desire to walk to a particular place is necessary before you take any steps. If that desire is not present, you will never take the first step. When you realize the self, that desire will go. Though I know that the self is changeless, it seems to me that my experience of it is different in different moments. Sometimes it is more intense, deeper. The peace and bliss are felt more intensely at certain times. The mind wants more peace, more bliss. It is not content with merely hearing or the Ahams Purana, the I I emanation. Is this creating a problem for me? Is my desire to keep going with my sadhana correct? In each moment I am having some experience of something that doesn't change. I am either hearing or feeling the Ahams Purana. But always there is this desire to go deeper, to be feeling more peace, more bliss. I am not satisfied with the experience I am having. Is this desire to do more sadhana a good desire? Or is it interfering with self-awareness? Your ultimate need is to get established in the changeless peace of the self. For this you have to give up all thoughts. If this has happened to you, nothing more is needed. If you are in the real state, there will be no wants, no desire to push on to some other state. In realization there will be no desire for anything else, and no doubt about whether anything is needed. This final state is just peace. There are no desires and doubts there. I am not experiencing the peace that Swami is talking about. I must therefore need to do something more. See who you are. That is the only advice I can give you. You are peace. Be that peace and there will be no hankering for anything else.
the problem seems to be asking for that peace, desiring it. The one who is asking is not you. The thoughts that come and go are not you. Whatever comes and goes is not you. Your reality is peace. If you don't forget that, that will be enough. And the subject of this conversation is a verse that Bhagavan wrote in 1913. It originally appeared in Sri Ramana Gita and was later incorporated into Uladu Narpadu Anubandham, the supplement to 40 verses. In the interior of the heart cave, Brahman alone shines in the form of the self, with direct immediacy as I, as I. Enter into the heart with questing mind or by diving deep or through controlled breath and abide in the self. In the Uladu Narpadu Anabandam, Bhagavan mentions the three paths self inquiry, observation of breathing, and diving within the heart. Could you please say something about this diving? What it is? How it happens? The result of following these three paths is the same, self-realization. And it can also be said that the three paths are also the same, although at first sight the description of them makes it sound as if three totally different techniques are being described. Bhagavan said, Do self-inquiry. Find out who you really are. When you are totally absorbed in this problem, this inquiry, will lead you to the self. Some people, though, said that they found this very hard, so they said that this method somehow didn't appeal to them. Bhagavan would sometimes tell such people to watch the breath to see where it arose. Bhagavan always maintained that mind and breath arose in the same place. So focusing attention on the source of the breath is really the same as focusing attention on the source of the mind to self-inquiry. The third option is diving within. This is not a separate path. It is just another description of what happens when you bottle self-inquiry or when you find the source of the breath through intense observation. Diving within means putting your whole mind on the self. When the one-pointed intensity to discover the self is there, diving in happens, and the mind goes back to its source and merges there. So there is no special method for diving within. It happens by itself. Is this true? It doesn't happen by itself. You have to go on making an effort until the point where you become totally effortless. Up to that moment, your effort is needed. The mind only gets dissolved in the self by constant practice. At that moment, the I am the body idea disappears, just as darkness disappears when the sun rises. I have read several books about the practical side of Bhagavan's teachings. Mauni Sadhu wrote about the I current Osborne wrote about a current that is not physical, but which can be felt physically. My understanding is that these writers were describing a current of some sort that helps sadhaks to be aware. It is said in these books that it can be felt very strongly. What is this current? Is it a special grace of Ramana, or is it common to all paths? Ramana and other gurus only show us the way. We have to walk on the path ourselves to realize the truth. If you want to go to America, having someone tell you where it is and how to get there will not magically transport you to that place. You have to go to the airport and get on the plane yourself. You have to carry out the instructions the guru has given you until you realize the truth for yourself. Grace takes us to the Guru. Grace shows us the way home by guiding us in the right direction. 
but we still have to do the work ourselves. My question is not so much about grace itself, it is about this I current that I have been reading about. Is it the grace of Ramana? Is it the grace of the self? I don't know the answer to this question, but I feel this current very strongly inside of me. This current, this I am consciousness is present within us all. It is not something special that devotees of one particular guru have. It is our nature, and as such it is common to all. But only a few souls are mature enough, or ripe enough, to be aware of it, though it is present within all of us. Grace puts us in touch with it and gives us a taste of what it is like. And once that taste is there, the thirst to realize the self follows. Tayu Manuvar, a Tamil saint whom Bhagavan often quoted, wrote in one of his poems, My guru merely told me that I am consciousness. Having heard this, I held on to consciousness. What he told me was just one sentence. But I cannot describe the bliss I attained from holding on to that one simple sentence. To that one sentence, I am a peace and a happiness that can never be explained in words. When Bhagavan spoke about the death experience that happened to him when he was about 16 years old, he said, I held my breath and kept my lips tightly closed so that no sound could escape. Neither the word I nor any other word could escape. Why did he do this? He did not want mental energy to escape through the mouth. The five senses are always moving outwards in an attempt to engage the world. The mouth is one of the channels through which the five senses move outwards into the world. When the mind and breath are restrained, when mental energy is not moving outwards to engage with the world and its objects, the mind starts to go back to its source. At 16, Bhagavan may not have known this, but this is effectively what happened. This death experience was something that happened to him. It did not occur as a result of something that he consciously did. Bhagavan wanted to know the answer to the question, Who am I? He seemed to find the answer straight away. When I ask the question, when I try to find out what the self is, I can reject thoughts that arise as being not me, but nothing else happens. I don't get the answer that Bhagavan did, so I am beginning to wonder why I am asking the question. You say that you are not getting the right answer. Who is this you? Who is not getting the right answer? Why should I ask? Asking has not produced the right answer so far. You should not persist and not give up so easily. When you intensely inquire, Who am I? The intensity of your inquiry takes you to the real self. It is not that you are asking the wrong question. You seem to be lacking intensity. In your inquiry, you need a one-pointed determination to complete this inquiry properly. Your real self is not the body or the mind. You will not reach the self while thoughts are dwelling on anything that is connected with the body or the mind. So it is the intensity of the inquiry that determines whether I succeed or not? Yes. If inquiry into the self is not taking place, thoughts will be on the body and the mind. And while those thoughts are habitually there, there will be an underlying identification. I am the body. I am the mind. This identification is something that happened at a particular point in time. It is not something that has always been there. And what comes in time also goes eventually for nothing that exists in time, is permanent. The self, on the other hand, has always been there. It existed before the ideas about the body and the mind arose, and it will be there when they finally vanish. The self always remains as it is, as peace, without birth, 
without death. Through the intensity of your inquiry, you can claim that state as your own. Inquire into the nature of the mind by asking with one pointed determination. Who am I? Mind is illusory and non-existent, just as the snake that appears on the rope is illusory and non-existent. Dispel the illusion of the mind by intense inquiry and merge in the peace of the self. That is what you are. And that is what you always have been.